If you think in terms of uh, ordinary least square regression, in terms of the REO principle, then we can break it down, as we've discussed earlier as well, into a linear representation. You've got a function f of x is equal to w transpose x, and you can add or not add the bias term. It doesn't really matter much, uh, as long as you understand the implications of that. And uh, that is the representation bit. And the optimization bit is we've got a target value for a given example, which is yi. And then we've got a prediction output f of xi for that example. We, we square the error, right? So we define this as the error uh, for a given example, right? It's the square error. And then we sum all of these errors for all the training examples. Uh, and that we call as the overall error, right? And uh, the third bit, oh, sorry, this should be evaluation, right? Evaluation. So a good uh, weight vector, W, would be one that minimizes this uh, sum, of, uh, sum of squared errors, okay? And uh, the way we can achieve that is very simple. We can do an optimization with respect to W. So the problem that we had was this one. We want to find a minimi minimum of this thing, the yi minus w transpose xi whole square for i is equal to 1 to n. So we know what the target value is. We know what the features are. What we don't know is this w. And this is our optimization problem. So this is the REO breakdown of uh, ordinary least square regression. And fortunately for us, if we take the derivative of this term, and I welcome you to try it out on your own, um, if you take the derivative of this and substitute it equal to zero, we end up with a very simple expression, which is w is equal to the pseudo inverse of x, which is indicated by x plus times, uh, sorry, times y. So we know the matrix, we know the vector y, we know all the data matrix x, and then we can recover this w. We have worked out a derivation of this. But this is essentially what we are doing in ordinary least square regression. One of the things, just like the perceptron, one of the things that you must have noticed is that this error function is, uh, or this optimization function, only has an error minimization component. So all we are doing is empirical risk minimization. There is no structural risk, structural risk minimization involved. Ideally, we should have a regression, uh, regularization term associated with it as well, right? So, uh, and the impact of that is going to be that we wouldn't be as sensitive to any outliers uh, as uh, we would be otherwise. So let's say if you have got these examples, there's an example over here for which the X value is one and the target value is something 3.5. Let's say we've got another example for which the X value or the independent variable value is two and we've got a corresponding Y value. And then we've got this third example, this third example over here and a fourth example over here. Now, if you see that most of these examples, these three examples are at least, they have a very good linear fit, but this fourth example is a bit far off, right? So this may be an outlier. And what happens if you don't use regularization, the impact of this, uh, this outlier is going to be much larger. Just like um, when we were talking about, uh, when we moved from perceptron to support vector machines, uh, we talked about the concept of margin. Here, we don't have the exact concept of margin, but we, we can relate it to regularization. We want the classifier to, to have a small norm of W. So we want to minimize this thing, right? So that a small change in the input X doesn't cause a large change in the output because our output is determined by simply a dot product with W, right? So a better representation would have been that if we had a regularization term and then we had the error minimization term and that we can write like this, yi minus w transpose xi square. And this would be, and if you want to, we can add a uh, regularization control parameter that we can call lambda. And then this would be a structural risk minimization uh, based uh, regressor. And that is what is called ridge regression, okay? So there's a name for it, for the algorithm that we just derived. We can have a regularization term over here, and then we've got an error minimization term over here. And this alpha parameter controls how much regularization we want to do. If we set no regularization, this would fall back to ordinary least square regression. If we pick a larger value of alpha, 
then what we're essentially saying is we want very small weight values uh, while we may be losing some error minimization in over the training data set. So ridge regression is another algorithm that you may want to use. It, it's going to probably perform better, but it would have this one extra hyperparameter then that you would need to tune using cross-validation. Okay, so this is the, uh, the pictorial representation of the comparison between OLS and ridge regression. Let's say we've got a single feature X and then on the Y axis the target value. We've got a bunch of examples and depending upon which examples you use uh, for particular training, let's say if you use this example and this example, then you're going to get a line that goes through both of these. And if you change the pair of examples, then you're going to probably get a different line, right? However, if you use ridge regression and then it's, it's, it's more stable, a small change in the input or the choice of the input example is not having that much of an impact on the line that is generated over here. So that is the impact of this regularized, regularization component. So ridge regression is basically minimizing a penalized version of least square regression. The penalizing shrinks the value of the regression coefficients. Despite the few data points in each dimension, the slope of the prediction is much more stable and the variance in the line itself is greatly reduced. What that means, is that if you think about, let's say, if, if you've got a training data set and you only pick two or three examples from it, then you can end up with very different lines uh, in case of OLS. So we would say that the classifier has a large variance over the training, over, over the choice of the parameters, right? Whereas it's more stable in this case when you do use regularization, okay? And I welcome you to try out this, this code over here that uh, it generates these plots and would give you more insight on the, into the role of regularization in case of ridge regression or in, reg, or in terms of regression in general, okay? There's another issue that uh, ordinary least square regression suffers from, and that is it penalizes too much. So if you think of the loss function that we have for uh, ordinary least square regression, and that is uh, essentially the output for a given example minus the target, right? And then we square it. So if we define E is equal to this much, that is the difference between the prediction and the output, then what we are essentially penalizing or the loss function we have is gonna be F of Xi comma Yi is equal to Yi minus F of Xi squared, right? So we penalize the square of the loss, uh, square of the error, right? And then that means we can plot our loss function like this which is shown in blue line over here. So if you're, if you're the difference between the prediction and the output is zero, the loss is zero. But as we move away from, from this uh, axis or if, as the classifier starts generating errors, then what we get is pretty large errors, right? So even if the error, if the difference between the prediction and the output is two, the error term that we get or the loss term that we get for that particular example is going to be four. And if it's three, it's gonna be nine and so on. So we get a quadratic loss. And though it may seem that this is ideal, we should be penalizing bad behavior, right? From the machine learning model. But at the same time, think of it like this. If you have a simple noise in your recording of the target value, then that is also going to have a large impact, right? So that is going to be problematic. We shouldn't be penalizing too strictly because we can expect that the, we can expect uh, we know that the, there can be noise either in the features or there can be noise in terms of the of the recorded true values. Okay, so due to the squaring of error of each data point in the loss function, both OLS and ridge regression can be very sensitive to outliers. Okay, we can reduce the impact of uh, these outliers by changing the loss function from square loss to something else, right? That something else can either be an absolute error. So instead of having the, sum, the square error, we can have an error function that minimizes, uh, we can have an error, error function that measures error between the prediction and the given true value simply as the absolute of these two. So rather than squaring it, what we get is this particular line over here. So whenever the error is zero, uh, the loss function value is zero. If the error is 0.5, uh, either in the positive or negative direction, the loss value is also 0.5, okay? So this is called, uh, you can call it absolute error.
and that's going to reduce the impact of an outlier because it's the output of the machine learning model and the target value doesn't match we are not penalizing it uh, penalizing that particular example or we're not we wouldn't be changing the weights of that by that big an amount uh, so that is going to be the impact of this particular loss function so it's going to probably behave better in com in comparison to ordinary least square regression in the presence of the outliers yet another loss function is what is called the epsilon insensitive loss function and what it's it's a simple extension of this uh, absolute error and what it does or what this loss function does is that it doesn't generate any error if the if the it doesn't generate any loss if the prediction and the output only differ by a small amount say epsilon so the error function that or the loss function we have for a given example x we have a prediction f of x and we have got a target value y then the epsilon insensitive loss can be written as that there is going to be no error, no loss if f of x and y is the absolute difference of them is less than or equal to epsilon and you can choose epsilon let's say if epsilon is 0.5 then if the difference between the prediction and the output is between Minus 0.5 and plus 0.5, there is no loss at the output. So that is why it's insensitive by an amount epsilon, and hence the name epsilon insensitive loss function. Beyond that, it does generate a linear loss. So if your loss, uh, if your, uh, if the difference between the prediction and the output is now one, then we get a loss of 0.5, which is less than what we had from the absolute error function or the absolute loss function. So probably it's going to be more robust to these outliers, okay? So that's the impact of this. If you use, this is the mathematical equation, by the way, for the, uh, for the epsilon insensitive loss function. If f of x of the difference between the prediction and the actual value is less than epsilon, then because this whole thing is going to be negative, the output is, the overall output of this whole thing is going to be zero uh, because of the max there. Right? So it's not going to generate any loss. However, if this loss value, if this uh, prediction value and this target value differ by an amount larger than epsilon, then what you're going to get is some loss. So this is the function that you get. Okay. So there is no loss whenever, let's say, the error is within the range of epsilon. Right. But beyond that, you do get a linear loss. And this function is called epsilon insensitive loss. If you use epsilon insensitive loss together with regularization, you get an algorithm that is called uh, support vector regression. Okay, that's that's the only different on, the only thing going on over here. So if you look at it, it's pretty simple or similar to uh, uh, to ridge regression, but instead of having a square error loss function, you have got a different loss different loss function, but it is also regularized. Sim similarly to a support vector machine, we have got a control parameter called C that models, uh, that controls the role of uh, empirical risk minimization and structural and, and this regularization term. Okay. So, so far we've talked about three different methods. We started off with very simple uh, OLSR or ordinary D square regression in which we are trying to find a W that minimizes the sum of square errors. And then we saw that if it does, it is not regularized, and we added a regularization term leading us to ridge regression. But we saw that even with ridge regression, because we are using a squared error loss function, the impact of that on outliers is going to be pretty large. So, so ridge regression can be sensitive to outliers. And to fix that, we changed our loss function from uh, squared error loss to epsilon insensitive loss, which doesn't generate any error when the amount of when the prediction and the actual output differ by a small amount which we call epsilon and beyond that it gives us a linear uh, linear penalty right so it, and if we do that we end up with an algorithm which is called uh, support vector regression and this is the optimization problem for that so if we break down support vector regression in terms of representation it has the same representation as uh, uh, an olsr or as a support vector machine it has a regularization term, but in terms of the loss function, instead of having the hinge loss function for classification, uh, we have the we have an epsilon in, epsilon insensitive loss function, uh, 
which is given over here. And then we can solve this optimization problem using gradient descent or using other approaches like quadratic programming or something, right? And this whole algorithm is called support vector regression. The good thing about this algorithm is that it can be kernelized as well using the kernel trick. And we have done that quite a few times now. So what we can say is that this weight vector w can be expressed in terms of the examples we have. Let's say j is equal to 1 to n xi, right? And if you substitute that in there, we're going to get a product of dot products. We're going to get dot products, which can replace with a kernel function. And thus, we can achieve nonlinear regression as well. So this is what's done over here. As you can do it with ordinary least square regression as well. You can do it with ridge regression. There's kernelized versions of ridge regression as well. But uh, those are going to suffer with the same type of problems with, in terms of outliers. So not particularly useful, I would say. So we have got this optimization problem for nonlinear, for uh, uh, SVR. We use the representative theorem, and we can that that means that we can write our simple uh, representation W transpose x plus b in this form, right? And if you look, there's a xi transpose x. We can replace that with a kernel function of k xi comma x, and we can choose different kernels just like we could in terms of support vector machines. And then we would end up with this kernelized variant that we can then use. Fortunately, we don't have to uh, go through all of this pain of implementing the optimization method ourselves because it's already implemented in support vector in, in sklearn and other libraries as well. But it's important to understand how this is taking place. How are we able to go from a, a linear regressor to a nonlinear one using this kernel trick? Okay, and you can use different kernels just like the support vector machine. You can use a polynomial kernel. If you think that the relationship between your variables is polynomial, you can use radial basis functions. You can use sigmoid kernels, any kernels that you want. And this is an example of support vector regression in practice. So you've got a single value, independent variable value called x, and then you've got a target value on the y, and you've got a bunch of training examples that are shown over here in black. So each one of these is a single training example. And the true relationship between these is, is like this. But if you just use a support vector, a linear support vector regression model, you get a line like this one. Or if you use an ordinary least square regression, you're going to get a similar line. Uh, but you can also try out with, or with a polynomial kernel or with an RBF kernel. And then you would end up with discovering these relationships between the independent variable and the target variable, as you can see over here. Okay, and you are welcome to try out the code at give, this given link. And it's pretty much the same way you, you would use uh, an ordinary, or you would use a support vector machine. Uh, so so that's, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of, uh, just like we had performance matrix for measuring how good or bad classification performance was, we have error matrix for measuring how good or bad regression performance is for a given regressor. So let's say we have uh, we have got a predicted score for each example and we've got an actual score for a given example. There are different ways of measuring uh, the amount of error on the validation set. So the rest of the practice is remains the same. You use a certain part of the training data set to find the, hyper param the parameter values, which are the weight factors. You have a validation data set that would allow you to select what type of method you should use what type of kernel you should use. And then you can have a test set over which you can calculate these performance metrics. And those can be uh, simply, you can measure the sum of squared errors. So you, what you do is you have a, you have a prediction output. We, I'm going to call it yi hat for a given example i. And you've got a true value of it called yi. And what you do is you simply do a sum of squares. And that's going to give you an estimate of how good or bad your uh, performance metric is, or how good or bad your classifier is. If this value is large, your classifier is, your regressor is bad. Okay, this should ideally be zero because we should, we want it to be pre to predict the target output exactly for a given test set. You can also measure uh, mean square error, so which is simply dividing this by one by n, and that is what mean square error means, as we discussed. If you, uh, these square values can really be affected by outliers, so sometimes it's actually better to measure mean absolute error, which is simply uh, this thing, like you measure the error for each example in absolute terms, 
you take the absolute of that and then you measure the overall mean of that error over a given given data set you can also measure what is called the root mean square error uh, you can also measure the correlation between the predicted and the actual so ideally the predicted and the actual value for a given example should all lie on this line because uh, if there is no error right so they should have a significant positive correlation between them that is uh, the, you, if you calculate the the Pearson correlation between the predicted and the actual values that should come out to be exactly 1.0. So you can use correlation co coefficients to measure the output value. You can also use something very commonly used called an R2 score, which is really interesting. And I welcome you to explore it on your own. This is uh, this actually tells you um, what in 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 res Unlike these terms, these uh, mean square error or mean absolute terms, this is going to give you a picture of uh, how good or your bad, how good or bad your regressor is in um, in absolute terms. So uh, ideally, you should shouldn't have any uh, error. So that means your y i should match i match up with your y i hat. So if you if you have such a good regressor, the numerator of this bit over here would go to zero, and then that means your for an ideal uh, regressor, your yi, your R2 value should be equal to 1.0. However, if you don't have that, which would typically be the case, you can end up with having R2 errors. Okay, and the way R2 measures this error is simply subtracting the the target value or the prediction value minus the average score, the average value of the of the training example. So let's say if you've got a training data set in which, or, or, or a validation data set in which you have the target values, and those target values are, let's say, one, three, five, or seven, and nine, then the mean of these is going to be five. So what we do is we subtract everything from this five. Okay, that's what's going, what this y bar indicates over here. And then we measure how much of an error that particular uh, prediction has relative to the mean of that. So in one way of interpreting R2 score is how good of a predictor is your regressor in comparison to simply the zeroth order predictor of average, okay? And if in that case, if uh, your classifier is not doing anything better than the predicting the mean of your data, then you are gonna get an R2 value, which is going to be zero, okay? So that's not good. So that's what this R2 measures uh, over here. You can also use correlation coefficients. A uh, complete list of different types of metrics that you can use uh, is available over here. As I said earlier, the overall workflow of, uh, of regression is roughly the same as classification. Uh, you have a training data set, you use those to find the parameters. You have a validation data set that you use to find the hyperparameters or select a certain set of features or a machine learning model. And then you can calculate the, the performance of a, or the accuracy of a regressor using any of these metrics. Each one of these metrics also has assumptions and I'm not gonna tell you that. That's something for you to explore on your own. Okay, I hope uh, this, whole, uh, uh, this whole idea of going from ordinary least square regression to support vector regression now makes sense. Please go ahead and try it out in SKLearn. Okay, thank you.